Intermolecular attractive forces hold molecules together in the solid and liquid phase. They are caused by the attraction of the positive end of one molecule to the negative end of another molecule. The partially positive hydrogen end of one water molecule attracts to the partially negative oxygen end of another water molecule. The stronger the intermolecular attractive forces, the higher the melting and boiling point will be and the lower the vapor pressure. Intermolecular attractive forces are also responsible for solubility, the ability of substances to dissolve into solvents. What causes intermolecular attractive forces? Intermolecular attractive forces are determined by the polarity of molecules. Polar molecules have partially charged poles that can strongly attract each other. For example, a dog sniffing another dog's butt. Now imagine the dog's nose being positive in charge and the other dog's butt being negative in charge. Nonpolar molecules have no permanent poles. They only have temporary poles caused by electron motion in the molecule. This will lead to very weak attractions. For example, in the flight patterns of birds, where they're still somewhat attracted to each other, but they are free to move around on their own volition. The attractive force strength of a molecule is highly dependent on the shape of the molecule. Here are some simple molecular shapes. Linear consists of two atoms. For example, these diatomic molecules of hydrogen and chlorine and the binary compound hydrogen chloride. Bent molecules have three atoms, one in the center and one bent off to an angle. These are single bonds, for example, in water and in hydrogen sulfide. Pyramidal molecules have four atoms, one in the center and three extending out in a pyramid shape. Ammonia and phosphorus trichloride each have a pyramidal shape. Tetrahedral shape, five atoms, one of them being central, in methane and carbon tetrachloride. The shape is determined by the unpaired valence electrons of the central atom. One unpaired valence electron will give you a linear shape. Two unpaired valence electrons will give you a bent shape. Three unpaired valence electrons will give you a pyramidal shape. And four unpaired valence electrons will give you a tetrahedral bond arrangement. In order to see these pairs of electrons being shared, we have molecular dot diagrams where you replace each dash or bond with two dots to represent the pair of shared electrons. For example, in H2, the single bond is replaced with two dots, each dot representing an unpaired electron being paired together with the other hydrogen. In hydrogen chloride, again, a single bond with two dots. Diatomic chlorine, Replace the dash with two dots. Oxygen forms two bonds. Replace each with two dots. Hydrogen sulfide, same exact thing. Ammonia, exact same thing. Phosphorus trichloride, three bonds, three pairs of shared electrons. Methane, CH4, once again, four pairs of shared electrons. And carbon tetrachloride, exactly the same situation. Fill in the unshared pairs so that each atom, except for hydrogen, has a stable octet. Now, a stable octet is eight valence electrons. Now, there are two electrons in a pair, so four pairs would be a stable octet. In the case of hydrogen, hydrogen has one, and hydrogen only has one energy level, and therefore, it cannot go any further. In the molecule of HCl, same thing. The hydrogen can only have two. The chlorine, though, has one shared pair, needs three unshared pairs to make a stable octet. For the chlorine, same thing. One shared pair requiring three unshared pairs for each. Oxygen has two shared pairs. It needs two unshared pairs to complete the stable octet. Same with hydrogen sulfide. With ammonia, the nitrogen has three shared pairs of electrons, so it requires a fourth unshared pair to make a stable octet. Same with phosphorus trichloride. Except in this case, the chlorines also each need three unshared pairs. Those are the bonds, and those are the extra unshared pairs necessary to make stable octets around each atom. In the case of the methane, the carbon already has four shared pairs. It can't have any more, and the hydrogens aren't big enough to have more than two, because they're so cute. And the carbon here also has four shared pairs, but this chlorine only has one shared pair. Same with this chlorine, this chlorine, and this chlorine. So each chlorine needs 
three more unshared pairs to make a stable octet. If you're dealing with multiple bonds, then you simply replace each dash with two dots. So a double bond would be two pairs of shared electrons. Replace these two bonds in oxygen with two shared pairs of electrons. For each of these double bonds in carbon dioxide, replace each double bond with two pairs of shared electrons. In the case of a triple bond, as in this diatomic nitrogen, replace each dash with two dots. Since there's three dashes, three pairs of shared electrons will be put in their place. Once more, here's the triple bond. Replace it with three pairs of electrons. And then again, fill in the unshared pair so that each atom except hydrogen has a stable octet. This oxygen has two shared pairs. So does this oxygen. Each oxygen requires two unshared pairs to make a stable octet. This nitrogen each has three shared pairs, which means they each need a fourth unshared pair to make their stable octet. This carbon already has four pairs of shared electrons. The oxygens only have two pairs of shared electrons each, meaning that each oxygen is going to require two more unshared pairs to make its stable octet. The strength of attractive force has to do with the polarity of the molecule, which is related to the molecule shape. Here are the molecules that we've been working on. To figure out the polarity of the molecule, to see whether the molecule will act as sort of like a magnet, determine the lines of symmetry that the molecule has. In other words, if you take a look at the molecule, how many ways can you slice it so that it's a mirror image on both sides? That has two lines of symmetry, 1H, 1H, half an H, half an H, half an H, half an H. This though only has one line of symmetry. This has two lines of symmetry. This has only one. There is no hydrogen up here to reflect. There is no hydrogen here to reflect. So there's only one line of symmetry. Same with this molecule here. What about this molecule? Well, you can only slice it one way to make it symmetrical and the same with the PCL3. The methane, on the other hand, well, you can slice it that way, or that way, or that way, or even that way. Wow! But the, the trichloromethane that we have right here can only be cut in one direction. Aww. Two or more lines of symmetry means that the electrons are distributed symmetrically around the molecule, meaning that no side of the molecule has greater electron pull than the other side. This makes the molecule nonpolar. So any molecule with two or more lines of symmetry is a nonpolar molecule. One line of symmetry is a polar molecule, and that means that the electrons are not evenly distributed. They're asymmetrically distributed, forming what's called a dipole, where the electrons are pulled towards whichever side has the greater electronegativity. So any molecule with only one line of symmetry is considered a polar molecule. The dipole moment is an arrow along the single line of symmetry towards the more electronegative atom. Now in this polar molecule, chlorine is more electronegative, so the arrow points toward that direction. Oxygen is the more electronegative atom, so the arrow points towards oxygen. Sulfur is not by a lot, but is the more electronegative atom. Nitrogen is the more electronegative atom. Phosphorus is the less electronegative atom. Chlorine has a higher electronegativity than phosphorus does. So notice the arrow goes towards chlorine along that line of symmetry. And this molecule here between hydrogen and chlorine, no contest. Chlorine has the higher electronegativity. The more electronegative side is therefore partially negative. Think about it. Electro negativity attracting the negative electron to it, making that side partially negative. So whichever side the arrow is pointing towards will be the partially negative end of the molecule. And of course the other side will be the partially positive end. This gives the molecules oppositely charged ends that can be attracted to each other to form intermolecular attractive forces. As the molecular polarity increases, as the electronegativity difference of the dipoles uh, increase, attractive force strength will also increase. 
Now for polar molecules, this gives you what are called dipole attractions, where the partially negative end of one molecule is attracted to the partially positive end of another, much in the same way as the north pole of a magnet is attracted to the south pole of another magnet. This has moderate attractive force strength. Here's a molecule of HCl. Now, notice the chlorine's got a significantly higher electronegativity difference, which means when they bond, the chlorine will have a higher density of electrons around it than the hydrogen does. This will lead to the chlorine having a slightly negative charge and the hydrogen having a slightly positive charge. If another HCl molecule happens by, the partially positive end of one will be attracted to the partially negative charge of the other. This gives you your dipole attraction. In HCl as a solid or a liquid, it's this attraction that holds those molecules together in that phase. Nonpolar molecules have London dispersion forces that are caused by temporary poles that result from electron motion. These are very weak because they're temporary poles instead of permanent poles. In this molecule of H2, here's an electron. I'm going to show you the path of this electron as it travels through this molecule. The electron is being shared evenly between the two hydrogens in this nice nonpolar covalent bond. So no poles are really developing. The electron doesn't really favor one side over the other. But if we freeze frame it, at this instant, the instant the electron is on this side of the molecule, this side of the molecule has a very weak, temporary, partially negative end. But only for the instant the electron is on this side. Once the electron's on this side, well, the charges now switch. But if at this instant another molecule just happens to pass by, for that instant you can get this very weak temporary attractive force called a London dispersion force. This electron really belongs on that side. But in the next instant, since the attractive force is so weak, that molecule just goes on its way again. London dispersion forces get stronger as the molecular size increases, as you have more electrons that can be unevenly distributed. And now for the most awesome attractive force of all, the hydrogen bond. This is not only a very strong dipole attraction, which attracts positive and negative ends of different molecules, but it also has temporary covalent bonding between the H end of one molecule and the N O or F end of another molecule. That's right. Here's how it works. Here's a water molecule. Now, the hydrogen end is partially positive and the oxygen end is partially negative. Now along comes another water molecule. Whee! Now, as the two come together, the fact that these have opposite charges slows that molecule down and attracts them. There's the dipole attraction. But the hydrogen bond part is the really cool part. Check this out. A temporary covalent bond actually forms between the hydrogen of one water and the oxygen of another. This temporary covalent bond makes the hydrogen bond particularly strong, incredibly strong. Now, if the temperature is such that the water is a liquid or a gas, then there's enough energy for the water to just continue on its way. If the temperature is cold enough to freeze it, well, then that water molecule will just kind of stay there, forming ice. Now this gives water its incredibly high melting point, boiling point, and surface tension for its size. Most molecules that are water size are gases at room temperature, but water is a liquid. You see, water molecules attract each other. Now this water molecule has four other water molecules to attract, and so does this one, and so does this one too, because it's going to have ones underneath. But the molecules at the surface, well, they only have to attract a couple of, of molecules each, which means they've got stronger attractions between them, making the surface of water almost like a skin that bugs can walk across. And that surface tension, the attractive forces, allows bugs to actually stand on the surface. Now, why does this work for them and not for us? Well, for one thing, they're incredibly light. They're incredibly tiny. So at their scale, hydrogen bonds are really strong. They're actually a significant part of that bug's life. But at our scale, thousands of times bigger, hydrogen bonds are just really too weak to have any real influence on your life. Except if you do a belly flop into a swimming pool, then you're going to feel the hydrogen bonds pretty quickly. They also allow DNA to form a double helix. Now, when you take a look at the base pairs that hold together the um, 
the DNA structure, these are not actually chemically bonded to each other because if they were, every time a DNA molecule unraveled, there'd be a really significant chance of damage being done to the base pair. The hydrogen bonds are not actually permanent bonds. They're only temporary, which means they're a lot more easily broken, which gives the DNA molecule a much better chance of successfully replicating itself over and over and over. And those are attractive forces.